Good evening. It's about 7.30 on the 18th of August. Uh, everybody else is having fun, given it's a Saturday night. Uh, here I am uh, doing a bit of prep work for next week. Uh, this is going to be about Tesla, uh, looking at Tesla following uh, some of the re recent articles that have been written. It seems like so much has happened in the last month or so, so I really want to be able to share uh, where I think things are at using some of these concepts. Before we start, this is not financial advice. I hold no financial qualifications whatsoever. This is about sharing some uh, ideas that I, I think people would find interesting, but nothing of this should be construed as financial advice. And if you want to do anything with these ideas, you need to get your own advice. Now, just to, uh, in terms of the ideas and some of these adhesive concepts, let me just share my screen here. Uh, tonight, I'll be just looking at the, Tesla situation from an organizational life cycle uh, model standpoint, which I'm the Australian Managing Director for the Adesis Institute. The Adesis Institute was set up by this gentleman, Dr. Rishak Adesis, uh, almost 50 years ago now. Um, incredibly clever guy, was voted, as you can see here, one of the world's top best communicators next to some pretty... Uh, pretty significant names and just has some really interesting concepts around organizations, why they grow, age and die, um, and how you can predict success. And so from an investing standpoint, if you can predict uh, things a little bit better, if you can predict what's happening inside the company, uh, you can you can make some better um, uh, investing judgments in, in our view, in, in my view. This is on behalf of myself, not of the whole institute. I'm a passionate investor and I like sharing some of these ideas. So just to sort of a, as a start, the, the broad issue that I think most investors need to constantly try and tackle is the issue of timing. And if we look at Tesla going all the way back, I mean, Tesla's come from a very low base and it shot up. And, and really for as long as, as I can remember, um, a lot of people have been very negative on Tesla. A lot of short selling, you know, huge valuations can't possibly be sustained. And, you know, the, the share price went from around 20, 20, 25, jumped up in a, in a year or so all the way to 250. I mean, it's really been trading sideways uh, ever since. And then um, last year had this sort of spurt here. Now, again, short sellers that have been short this, during this period of time have, have been in a lot of pain. There's been a lot of uh, a, a lot of pain sort of from the short sellers. But a lot of this stuff from the organizational life cycle model that I'm gonna take you through, all of these things were absolutely normal. Um, and so trying to short sell or trying to sort of uh, go against the company here has been very expensive. And the reason why um, is a lot of this stuff we found is normal. They've had incredibly high investor support, but what we're starting to see is some of the abnormality come in that I'd like to share with you. So I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll jump in um, to this little slide deck. So this comes from a book called Managing Corporate Life Cycles by Dr. Adesis. Um, we've all seen the human life cycle. Uh, depending on where you are in the world and depending on, you know, what, what your view of retirement looks like, move to Noosa, move to Florida, move to wherever. But through this life cycle, it's quite easy to see the human life cycle and what's normal and what's abnormal. But for organizations, they also have normal and they also have abnormal. And if you don't understand where an organization is in its life cycle, you don't know what's normal and what's abnormal. And a lot of the stuff we've seen from Tesla has actually been very normal, hence why I've certainly been sitting on the sidelines. However, we're now starting to see some abnormal issues creep in. Again, in the human life cycle, opportunities are totally um, based on the life cycle, the goals are uh, dependent on where you are in your life cycle, what the right structure is depends on where you are in the life cycle, leadership, rewards, uh, a range of things. And so here's the organizational life cycle. Again, similarly, there has things like courtship and infancy and, and go-go's a bit like a toddler, the, the toddler phase, adolescence prime. The, the main difference being that 
we don't believe organizations need to die. Obviously, we know the human life cycle ends in a certain position, but uh, we don't believe organizations need to die. And between certain phases, organizations can move back and forward. Uh, they're not fixed, whereas the human life cycle is obviously uh, a, a, a standard progression quite often. Uh, here, we believe organizations can move up and back and down and, uh, and, and jump across into things like premature aging. And so where Tesla has been is it got out of infancy and it's got into what we describe, what we describe as a go-go company. So let's just have a look at that. And, and all of these things, there are normal problems, abnormal problems, all of this is, is different. And for many years, short sellers have been going against Tesla, but all of those things were normal and I don't think that they should have been betted against as seen by the share price. Now we're starting to get into abnormal problems. Now we're starting to see them go after opportunities that are not relevant for their life cycle. We're starting to see the wrong goals. We're starting to see structural problems. We're starting to see leadership problems and we're starting to see reward problems. So let's have a look at, uh, let's have a look at this. So go, go. What is this go, go? It's a, it's a, I mean, this picture, it's like, it's no longer an infant company. It's sleeping through the night, but it's, it's sort of wants to try everything. It's, it's, wants to do different things, it, it gets upset quite regularly, it doesn't yet know that it doesn't have sort of control, uh, lack of controls or lack of understanding of the world around it. It thinks it knows everything and, and it gets really upset when the people around it um, don't want what they want. I mean, when you think of the two and three year old um, kids, when others don't want what they want, they get really upset and when you look at Elon and Tesla, this, this aggression against the short sellers, you know, there's this real upset that, hey, how, how come you're not on board? How come you don't want what we want? And so we also describe it as this idea of space syndrome, a lot of these organizations. They're sort of, they're expanding at the edges, but they're collapsing at the core. And when you look at um, Tesla, I mean, without a doubt with, and not just Tesla, but let's call it the, the Musk universe between SpaceX and Tesla and the boring company and all sorts of different things, absolutely expanding, but the core of it is well and truly starting to, to collapse. And that black hole, I think, is getting bigger. And so when we look at the normal problems, I mean, the, 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 well, not even normal problems, the normal situation, you know, it's high growth, it's rapid. Um, it's, uh, what's happened there? Sorry. Um, yeah, so there's lots of priorities and new initiatives. Um, everything, let me just get back up here. It's very confident. They like to make their own rules. They assume more revenue equals more profit. Um, you, you know, the, the standard saying being, you know, we lose on every item produced, but we make up for it in volume kind of thinking. Uh, they're, they're organized around the visionary. They're organized around the founder or the, or the founders in some situation. There's insufficient accountability and controls. And, and often there's some conflict at, at senior levels. And when we look at Tesla, these things have been playing out for a lot of years. Um, you know, growing companies never have enough cash. They're always losing money. They're always sort of going uh, as, as fast as they can go. And to a large extent, that has been normal. And so again, in the presentations I use here, here he is. But let's have a look at the abnormal situation. It's fine to have rapid growth, but when you have unfunded rapid growth, I mean, when you look at a balance sheet, when the liquidity ratios and all those things are getting into absolute insolvency territory, um, combined with, uh, with some other things, that is abnormal. When, there's, when the overconfidence turns to arrogance and when you look at the way Elon's been handling a number, of, uh, a number of issues, there's no way you can describe that as anything other than absolute arrogance, um, whether it's the uh, trying to solve the Thailand um, cave uh, issue and the way that those things were, were handled, the way that he handles a lot of the investor communications, it's just creeping in. When there's a, you know, it's, it's, it's fine to have lots of priorities, but when there's a total lack of focus, the fact that you could be ramping up Model 3 production that's clearly not going that well and decide to get involved in the, uh, the Thai cave situation and make flamethrowers and start, you know, making boring things and all these kinds of things. I mean, it's just a lack of focus. 
um, with no controls. Again, he's admitted recently he can, he, he never got uh, board approval to tweet out the going private at 420. Um, clearly, he does what he wants. He's chairman and CEO, which is which can be highly dysfunctional. Um, again, it's it's one thing to for for some companies to hope for miracles, to hope that different things will occur, but when you're actually relying on miracles to to take the company private to save it from its capital position, in my view, is just an absolute you know, longing for a, a miracle that, that it seems that uh, is going to be incredibly difficult. Premature profit focus. This one people find quite interesting. Um, but, you know, having, if, if, if profit becomes the center, what starts to happen is bad decisions start getting made, bad priorities. Go-go companies don't yet have the controls and the systems and all those things to, to really be efficient. Um, and so if profitability is put first and foremost above developing all those other, other items, what we find is that that starts driving bad behaviours, bad decisions, and it gets into a pickle. Uh, and another one is, is sort of this idea of repeated go-go. And when you look at Tesla and a number of Elon's... Uh, I guess ventures. It's sort of gotten into go-go, but then got itself into trouble and back into infancy. It hasn't been able to sustain itself. It started. It, it's it's come very close to uh, to going broke and becoming bankrupt. And 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 it seems again on the face of it, with the balance sheet, um, we're uh, we're about to have another uh, another crack. The thing that I can't quite work out is given the um, balance sheet issues and given the stock valuation, how the arrogance has crept in so much to sort of try and prove all the shorts wrong of not raising capital. Um, I mean, the, to, to, to try and <clears throat> complete the vision that they're trying to complete with the operational issues that they clearly have uh, doesn't seem to make sense, but anyway. And again, con conflict at senior levels is, is, uh, is normal, but when it turns destructive, when um, I've got a little uh, little folder here full of some charts, um, this from uh, from Twitter. When you start to have this is all Tesla's executive departures. Now, to be honest, I don't know exactly what the definition of an executive, but when you look at this sort of creeping up, even back here, this was incredibly high for a go-go company. When you're losing that kind of expertise. When you're losing that kind of thing and the, conf the conflict is becoming more and more destructive, that becomes an absolute, uh, an absolute problem. And so these are the things that have be started to become abnormal. So if we look back at the chart, uh, this is what I've been looking out for. This is what I've been sort of waiting for. About here, we started to see some of the operational things come through, but even then, it didn't seem to be all that, uh, all that problematic. There was a few incidents through. This is on weekly. I might just change it to uh, change it to daily. Um, you know, we can see that we're on a downward. <clears throat> to me, this is where it had started. This is where I bought my uh, my first. The way I sort of short companies is through long dated put um, options. Uh, this is where a lot of that stuff had all started to play out quite a bit. And then here we have the call, the Q2 call, where um, I think we will find that a lot of that stuff was misleading. I mean, little things like the CFO was asked, were you profitable in July? Keeping in mind that this call, I think, was early August. And for the CFO to say, well, our numbers aren't in. I mean, CFOs know roughly <clears throat> within a, a, a short amount uh, what their numbers are. Absolutely. Even Elon would, would know. And so to sort of say that we don't know, I think was deflecting the issue. But what happened? He apologised. He promised a whole lot of things again. Then we have here the, hey, I'm going to take the thing private. And so a lot of that stuff, I think, just bucked the trend that was occurring. But I think we're now back into that. And again, because of these normal uh, and abnormal issues. So if we have a look at some of these other slides, one of the things I said was, you know, go-go companies think that more sales equals more profit. And when you have a look at this chart here and the way that uh, the losses just keep going, even though 
their deliveries are going like this. That's totally normal for a go-go company, but we're now getting to the stage where the balance sheet just can't cope with these kinds of losses. So that's where we're starting to get abnormal. The fact that they haven't raised capital yet just really tells me there has to be an issue. I mean, when you've got a 60 billion market cap to raise a few billion dollars to sort of get rid of all of the issues, uh, maybe not all the issues, but a lot of issues and to prove people wrong, even if it comes highly diluted, uh, sorry, at a, at a high discount, you know, even if you've got a discounted to get that balance sheet, to get people off your back, pardon me, that's what I think you should be, uh, be doing. And then also, one of the recent photos that came out, I found this a bit funny, you know, where people compare Amazon versus Tesla. I mean, there's Bezos sort of uh, in his uh, highly athletic chiseled uh, approach. And this is one of the recent photos. And again, um, I just find that a little bit worrying that when CEOs, uh, I mean, the first thing that often goes is them when they, he is just looking terrible. Um, there, which means he's not looking after himself. And again, uh, think of the analogy of you, you're always supposed to put the oxygen on yourself before you help others. You have to be able to look after yourself. And when I see this starting to happen, um, this to me is at least, it's, it's not everything, but it's one of the one of the signs that the stress and the strain. And in, in the recent article, he's admitted to that. He's admitted to um, the, the personal stress, the strain, the, the different things, and that's and that's absolutely uh, that's absolutely playing out. Um, and he's under a lot of uh, a lot of scrutiny. I mean, this one I found really interesting. This was a tweet about the fact that um, what was it? it, it the fact that the, the parking lot in the last couple of days has been incredibly empty, and the assertion was, well, without that um, those people there to to, to complete the, the production of the cars, um, there's no way they're going to make their numbers. And so this question here, you know, how are you certain you, that they just haven't improved the logistics? But this person here I've been following who's been doing a fantastic job um, just talks about the different data points, including truck drivers checking into the local motel. You know, that kind of scrutiny, which I think is absolutely fine and absolutely deserved, um, is going to, if things aren't going right, if you're trying to sort of put on a brave face, if you're trying to, you know, put out a million fires, you're going to end up not looking after yourself potentially and that's where you're going to um, to end up. So, so for me, I'm short now and uh, going to be adding to it, I believe. And what we find... So th this is this is go go. This has all been normal. Now that we're here, this is where we need to look at. And so, what's one of the core the core issues? Well, the core issue is what what uh, we call is this is this this founders trap. <clears throat> the reality is that the vast majority of companies, as in ninety something percent, never survive their founder. The reality is they get into go go and they die off. Sometimes they die off in a year, ten years, a hundred years but they just don't survive. And when you look at the statistics, um, it's absolutely the case. Now, some founders are able to sell the business onto somebody else, but more often than not, it then dies on the hands of the new owner. And so what the core issue is that uh, in Adesis, we have this change loop. We say, look, change creates all problems and opportunities that we then need to manage. Managing creates more change, and, and we get stuck in this change loop. And all managing really is, is deciding what to do and then implementing that decision. And so change, there are some uh, predictable changes in the life cycle. Again, they're gonna create problems and opportunities. There's, there's changes in the market. Yeah, Tesla has new competitors coming, <clears throat> a hell of a lot of them. There's a huge amount of investment going in. It can be changing consumer demands. It can be all sorts of changes. Um, and, and what happens is good founders or great founders are really great at managing this change loop. And what happens is they often put themselves in the center. They see the problems and the opportunities. They decide and they drive implementation. And for as long as the company can do that, everything's fine. Problems get decided on, get implemented. But what starts to happen at a certain point, and, and Elon just has more capacity than most, I think. I think when you look at it, 
he's been able to, it hasn't been pretty in some of the areas, but he's been able to manage this change loop really well. And that's often what founders, founders do. But what happens is over a period of time, they fall behind. They're not identifying the problems and the opportunity. It just becomes too much. If you're the center of the universe, and then think back to that chart I just showed of all the executive departures and you keep adding on more and more roles because you think you can just do anything, you fall behind and you end up in this position of, of uh, things just get in the way. And so it's not actually um, problems being the problem. It's a problem is only a problem if you don't have a way of making a great decision and implementing it. And so what we sort of see again from analyzing from an investment point of view, to me, looking at over the last few years, they've, they've been able to identify problems, deal with opportunities, they've been able to decide, they've been able to implement, but that is now falling behind. Um, and, and the other thing to really understand with this, this life cycle model is that we don't actually mention time. And so, sorry, not mention, we don't measure time, whilst time can have a bit of a factor. We're measuring two things. Uh, first is flexibility. When you're really young, your flexibility is high and then it sort of comes down and it drops off and then ends up really low. And then when you're really young, your predictability, your self-control, your controls in general, they start off quite low and then they sort of grow. As we know, they go up and then we know they come down a little bit in that, in that, latter, in that latter phase. And so when you have no flexibility whatsoever and you've got no predictability, self-control or controls, that's it. Over Red Rover, we call that death. But where it meets the first time, we call that prime. Prime is where you still have good flexibility, but you now have the controls, the predictability, the self-controls. And so when you look at these two charts together, you can see that, say, in the early phase of the life cycle, when flexibility is really high, we can create new models, we can buy new things, we can do all sorts of different stuff, but you don't yet have the predictability or the self-control or the controls, there's going to be a range of issues. And with Elon and his lack of self-control recently, the lack of controls inside Tesla, when you look at the operational issues, when you look at all those issues, they're quite significant. Um, that's, where, that's where I've been seeing it being normal, but now we're entering this founder's trap area, potentially, if we don't get on top of it. Now, this is what makes me really excited for this particular trade. You should never really bet against a go-go company. Look at Amazon. Anybody betting against Amazon, irrelevant evaluation is just has gotten cream. The same with with uh, with Tesla to date. But I think what we're doing is we're about to enter what we call adolescence, because in the most recent article, there's now floating of this idea of a COO, somebody else to come in to take off the operational load. So what happens is we find about one percent of companies do this proactively. They decide, you know what, we're going to proactively enter this adolescence period. But the adolescence period is incredibly difficult. If you think about the human life cycle, adolescence is one of the most difficult periods because the kid used to get all of its controls, its, its uh, vision for the future, its structure, its clothing, its all those things from the parents. And now there's a separation. The, the kid has to go out alone. The kid now has to get its own vision and mission. It has to make its own mistakes. It has to get its own structure. And, and it becomes really difficult. And there's a lot of energy, a lot of headbanging that goes into it. And it's a really difficult time. And for, for, for the way I use these ideas for investing, it's either a time, if, it, if we're at quite high valuations, it's a time to short or it's a time to stay out. Whilst 1% of people do it proactively, what we, the majority is reactive. And again, this comes from the organizational life cycle book I mentioned before. This is across seven, over 70 countries for nearly 50 years. This isn't just Tesla. This is any company you find where the founders or the family are about to appoint for the first time a CEO, a COO. Often it's not handled well and it's because of reaction to operational problems investments go bad, expansion goes bad, they get sued, or maybe there's a loss of control. And what, what we're seeing is we're seeing this playing out with Tesla now. There are tremendous operational problems. 
platforms. You can look all the way through Twitter and have a look at all of the, not just anecdotal stuff, but the actual real stuff, the real evidence of their operational issues, which are absolutely normal at a certain phase, but become abnormal if we don't get on top of them. Investments going bad. I mean, Solar City, the bailout of Solar City, that Solar City has not done anywhere near what Elon had hyped it to do. And all it's done is saddled Tesla with billions of dollars worth of debt that it didn't have before. Again, expansion going bad. I mean, with the Model 3, when you're a boutique, small niche um, car manufacturer and you expand into the mass market, that is a high, that's a different business. That's high risk. He treated it like lots of entrepreneurs where, what did he call it? The alien dreadnought system thought he could automate everything. We haven't seen in the balance sheet yet the write downs that I think are going to come from the capital equipment that was just totally wasted. They get sued. There is going to be that many legal court actions. I think it's going to be incredible. I don't think Tess, uh, Elon's lost control yet. He's still the largest shareholder, but uh, if he needs cash and push comes to shove, I think you're going to find that this is put on him. So, and so what happens in adolescence is there's a need for professional management. And by that, I'm, I'm not saying that families or founders are unprofessional, but there are, there are people out there that don't quite have the entrepreneurial zeal, but are incredibly good managers. They manage it professionally. <clears throat> it needs prioritization now. There needs to be the systems and accountability that it hasn't had before. We need to decentralize the entrepreneurship in adolescence. I mean, if you look at Elon on Twitter and he's just the one man entrepreneur machine and for as long as he's there, everything, there's some entrepreneurial zeal. But what happens if the company can't cascade that, if it can't decentralize it and get more people coming up with entrepreneurial ideas, when Elon leaves, all of those ideas leave as well. It's sort of a second birth is the best way to, to, to describe it. And what it needs is a new structure. At the moment, everything's structured around Elon. And that's totally normal. That's exactly what go go companies are. I have a person, and these people will do multiple tasks for me. Now, what needs to change is here's the task, and who's the best person? So you can imagine the amount of grief and conflict we have had all of these people in there doing multiple things and now we need to change the structure. Now the key is to do all of these things in the right sequence. If you don't do it in the right sequence, um, it's a real problem. And this is really where Adesis uh, from a, a, a sort of an organizational assistance point of view is what we do for clients. It's not consulting. We don't tell them what their problems are and how to fix them. We help them come up with their issues so, and then be able to give them the sequence to resolve it. And from an, an investment analysis point of view, you can then, if you understand the sequence, you can work out whether it's been done right or wrong. And so here's a couple of pictures. You know, this is what it becomes like. You, it just becomes, there becomes this high angst, love-hate relationship with uh, between the company and the founder there's a lot of energy the new ceo or coo after a while just gets a lot of attacks from the founder because it's not doing it exactly the way they would and, and we have what's called seagull syndrome they fly in crap all over the place they go straight to employees they they breach all of the new structure that's been put in place <clears throat> they fly in and then they fly back out on their jet They've got their other things. So with Elon, we've got SpaceX and Boring and whatever else. If a COO comes in and he goes out, he'll then be coming back in absolutely and, and doing that. And here's just a little cartoon, you know, you're close to the big guy, will you help us kill him? It just happens so often that uh, the, new, the, the new management have, uh, have difficulty dealing with the, with the old. You know, the, if we look at Apple the first time, this is exactly what happened. Apple came out of infancy with Jobs and Wozniak and got into GoGo -Go and was doing all these different things. And they proactively, they go out and they find Scully. But <clears throat> Jobs was one of the internet pioneers, the, the entrepreneur pioneers. He'd already given away control of that company by the time he got in. And so when this destructive conflict occurred, Jobs was out. Scully was still in. Now, Scully gets a kicking because it said that, hey, <clears throat> Scully almost killed Apple. No, not a chance. 
What Scully did, if you think back to those previous charts, is he brought in the systems, the process, the predictability, all of those things. Now, some might argue he, he went too far or the, or the next CEO at least went too far. But when Jobs came back in at Prime, he had a company that was far more predict, um, predictable, far more systemized control. He was able to come in, simplify, bring in some new innovation, bring back that entrepreneurialism. If Jobs had stayed, he would have killed it. If Stully, Scully had stayed, he would have killed it. And so that's why I said earlier on, leadership is actually a function of where you are in the life cycle. Jobs went off, he spent 10 years learning all the things that he didn't know as sort of this adolescent go-go kind of company and came back and look at Apple today. And so for Tesla, if there can be the right sequence, if they can get the right plan, if they understand what needs to happen, we can get some success. And so again, <clears throat> when we look at this, you know, where do we start? Well, we always start at this change loop. It's, it's getting this change loop managed really, really well. It's understanding the changes that come from between this life cycle and understanding what this cross is. And this cross is conflicts. That's ultimately what's coming down. And so when we look at the, again, the share price uh, inside the company, even though it's a lot of this stuff before Elon and his Twitter, I think I've got a little chart on the Twitter here. I mean, the thing that's really gotten, and, and again, I think this is a sign of stress. When you have a look at, here's the go-go years where everything's really good. <clears throat> everything's going really well, top of the game. There's a few nasty short sellers out there, but hey, the share price is growing. But then look at this manifestation. This is a reaction. Um, to, I think, the stress and strain of the wheels falling off. This is what we're starting to uh, starting to see. And that's why I'm of the opinion that we're going to see, once these kinds of levels around here are breached, if there isn't a significant reversal of some of the operational issues and some of these things going on. But the problem is, because of the tweets and because of everything else, I think there's there's some stuff set in motion it's going to be hard to change. And so let's just have a look at some of these uh, conflicts. I'll fly through them. You know, there's a conflict of deciding what to do and implementing. So I mentioned that, that uh, <clears throat> entrepreneurs are really great at managing this change loop for a period of time before they fall off. Well, to make a good decision, you need democracy. You need to actually have sort of different views, different points of view, uh, different um, perspectives, but if you sit there in democracy land, you never get anything done. And that's why we say we need to have this implementation aspect. And that's what we call democracy. Uh, that was one of Dr. Odysseus's first uh, concepts uh, way back when he did his doc doctoral, uh, doctoral uh, dissertation in Yugoslavia, of which there's a, uh, a great book about that. Democracy is what needs to be installed, but go-go companies don't know how to do that. Elon's been operating under dictatorship <clears throat> for however long. If you look at, I think, one of the previous annual, or the previous uh, annual shareholders meeting, Elon invites them all up onto the stage. They hardly say anything. They hardly say anything. And so what it means is you only end up with people that are willing to operate in that environment, which is a much smaller subset of the total people available. And so this conflict needs to be gotten on top of, being able to implement some democracy without losing the implementation dictatorship. There's a conflict of roles. There are four broad roles for any organisation, and I'll quickly go through them. There's the P. This is all about wowing the customers, it needs drive, and if you can produce what your customers want, you can be effective in the short term. And if you look at Elon and Tesla, they are high P. They, are, they produce some amazing product. I, nobody can argue with, say, the Model S and even the Model, uh, the Model 3, excluding some of the ones with quality issues, of course, but they're great products. People love the product. But <clears throat> you can be effective in the short term, but you need this next ingredient called the A, the administration. This is around the infrastructure. This is the controls. This is about systems thinking. And this is about being efficient. And this is... Tesla has just grown too far. 
Most companies that go broke, they grow broke. They don't grow broke. They don't go broke because of, of falling sales. They often grow because they're going too much because they don't have this A ingredient. Again, we're talking about a toddler organization yet uh, um, that doesn't have the experience, the systems, the controls. And so in order to be effective and efficient in the short term, you need to have these two ingredients of which from an investment analysis point of view, clearly Tesla is, is uh, missing. But if you're effective and efficient in the short term, change will kill you. So you need this next ingredient called the E, it's the entrepreneurial ingredient. This is all about the vision, the risk, new products, new development. And if you can be entrepreneurial, you will be effective in the long term because you are constantly bringing new products to new things that customers want. So where PA is effective and efficient in the short term, E is about being effective in the long term. It's the I that kills companies or it's the lack of developing it. The integration. It's the people, it's the who. This is about getting the sort of real uh, shared purpose mission, <clears throat> of a shared purpose in the mission and the vision. This is about leadership from within. This is about creating a, what we call a culture of mutual trust and respect. And if you look at Elon, the ability to integrate in the past was quite high. But when you get into fight with analysts, when you call a national hero that was uh, helping the kids in Thailand a pedophile, when you when you have high executive departures what are we seeing we're not we're seeing the opposite of integration we're seeing disintegration and so you need this e and the i to be effective and efficient in the, the long term and so we can make a code out of this and so is tesla i would say in the past has been big p little a big e little i p a e i but <clears throat> more recently the p and the e i think has killed the a when you have a look at Again, Twitter is an amazing, um, you can't believe everything that's on Twitter, but you get an idea and you can then go and research. You can go straight to the source. You can go straight to the person to validate. They've lost their A and their I. Like I said before, their I has fallen out the window. Now, if you have a look at the Q2 conference call when Elon started apologizing to the analysts, what was he actually doing? He was integrating. He was integrating back with the people and integration is, is, is a really under, undervalued uh, asset. And so again, PAEI, you can use this to analyze investments, but where's the conflict? Well, there's a conflict between all of these. Tesla is producing amazing cars, but <clears throat> the administration isn't there. To, that is in conflict. You would love to make a car that costs a million dollars to make your customers happy. But if you can only charge 50,000 for it, that is not very efficient. And so these things are in conflict. Constantly entrepreneuring, constantly bringing in new ideas is in conflict with bringing in the systems and the controls. You know, I could, there's many different conflicts, but understanding that conflict exists and if you don't understand that these roles exist and the conflict exists, at some point, you're going to have a problem. If you don't have balance, if you're totally E and all of your decisions are all entrepreneurial and it's only about the entrepreneurial stuff, this is going to cause a problem in your change loop. There's a conflict in personal styles. Again, similar to PAEI from roles, we also have styles. Now, these I'm going to call, I'm going to focus on the mismanagement. I'm going to take the worst of it just to show you uh, at high level. Um, <clears throat> these are what we call mismanagers. These are the archetypes. So the first one, the P, no A, no E, no I, meaning that person has no skill, no respect, no ability for the other ingredients. We call them the Lone Ranger. Head down, bum up, go and get some stuff. It's all about fast results. The A, no P, A, uh, no P or E or I, we call them the bureaucrat. This is very slow, <clears throat> all about spreadsheets, loves to say no to everything. We have the E, which we call the arsonist. They just start fires, new ideas all over the place, but don't have the P to get anything done, don't have the A to make it somewhat efficient, and don't have the I to try and keep people integrated with them. And then there's the I, which we call super follower. 
<clears throat> which is all about trying to make everybody happy, trying to make them all integrated. They can't get anything done. They've got no long-term vision. It's all about make sure people are happy. Then there's a final one, which we call Deadwood, which, which organizations can tend to create um, by killing off the other ingredients. And so if we look at Elon, I think in the past he's been PAEI, uh, small a, small i, <clears throat> but at the moment, this absolute focus just to produce stuff and bring on new products without focusing on the A and without bringing in the integration means that we have a mismanagement problem. Now, what he needs is <clears throat> because there is no perfect manager, you can't be perfect, you have to be able to have a complementary team. It's okay to be low A if you have, low, uh, if you have somebody else that's high A looking after it. The problem is that creates conflict high A people and high P people conflict, high A people and high E people conflict. Think of the conflicts that are often happening between human resources, accounting, legal, with say sales and marketing. Sales and marketing are more PE, <clears throat> accounting, legal, they're all about controls. I mean, we've all been in organizations and seen those conflicts. So again, if you don't understand those conflicts, that changes the change loop. And from an investment perspective, these conflicts have started playing out more and more. There's a conflict of perceptions. Uh, <clears throat> there's an in and is the one and the should. Is one should. And what happens is entrepreneurs tend to perceive the world as they want it. That's why they're seen quite often as quite um, dishonest. Elon in his own mind won't be, I don't believe, being <clears throat> trying to be uh, untruthful. But he perceives the world as he wants it. It's the same with, I think, from the Steve Jobs book. Uh, they call it the Steve Jobs reality distortion field. What was he trying to do? He always talked about what he wanted. Reality, which is the is, was not relevant. It was always about what we want. And what happens is when, when um, founders or entrepreneurs become too pathological, they talk about what they want not what it is, and then people find that to be incredibly dishonest. And so Elon, when he talks about funding secured, he would have had a conversation with somebody, they, there would have been some things going on, and in his mind, what he wants is funding secured. What he wants is 5,000 per week. What he wants is cash flow positive. And not only that, they use the perceptions to alter the definition of words. So his version of funding secured He's going to try and wiggle out of it. I always thought achieving 5,000 cars per week meant every week. But no, it's a burst extrapolation. Again, he's changed the perception of that. There's a conflict of values, conflict of definitions, conflict of interests. Um, these are the conflicts that all come together that when they're, when, when they're not um, creating problems is totally normal. Now, the interesting thing is you can't buy your way out of these. It doesn't matter how much capital you've had, how much uh, previous success, these two companies here, when you analyze the failure of them in the context of these conflicts, this is what actually killed them. When Blockbuster, <clears throat> when, when you're an executive and all of your remuneration and your bonuses come from a short-term orientated business model here that was far more A, it was all about efficiency um, over effectiveness. There wasn't the entrepreneurial ingredients in it. When you read some of the issues, they had an absolute conflict between deciding and implement, um, implementing. They didn't perceive some of these other technologies to be coming in. There's, again, when you analyze the failure of businesses, Netflix didn't kill Blockbuster. The digital camera didn't kill Kodak. Those are manifestations. It was a combination of these conflicts that stopped them managing the change loop. A change happened. New technology came available for both of them. Kodak invented the digital camera. That created problems and opportunities that they needed to manage. And they needed to make great decisions and then implement those decisions. But these conflicts, when you analyze it, got in the way and it led to their demise. Now, the same thing is going to be happening at Tesla. When you have a look at the interests and definitions and values and perceptions and styles and roles, I mean, when you look at the board, the conflicts of their interests, their styles, their definitions, their role, 
All of this is coming together to cause a significant problem. And so how do we remove these conflicts? And so if you're an investor investing in a, in a small company or a large company, or you might be working for a corporate that finds these ideas interesting, how do we remove them? You can't. You absolutely can't. But you can make them constructive. You can move them from destructive to constructive. <clears throat> and so how do we do that? Well, first, we've got to understand that with this, with this situation, if we do nothing in life, so if we do nothing with this conflict, it will be destructive. If you just keep driving straight down the highway of destructive conflict and do nothing, it's going to be destructive. We need to be doing something. We need to be looking out. We describe it as a bit of a signpost. We need to proactively make a turn, turn off course towards constructive conflict. Because in reality, the, the uh, I guess the involvement with the change loop depends on whether it's destructive conflict or whether it's constructive conflict. If you look at Tesla, again, the destructive conflict that is moving into their change loop Destructive conflict is coming in. They're getting problems that's coming <clears throat> from that destructive conflict. They need to make it constructive. And the way we make that constructive is through this concept that we call mutual trust and respect. But trust and respect, again, if we think of the conflict of definitions, we need to add these to it. First is that we share a common interest. So I will forego today knowing that I'll be made up for in the future. When we have a look at a lot of failure and a lot of things that have happened, what started to, to happen is there wasn't a common interest across everybody that allowed somebody to forego today, knowing that they would be made up for in the future. And respect is the undeniable right for somebody to think differently to you and you want to learn from the disagreement. These are incredibly important. When we have a look at Tesla, its, its ability to survive and succeed is going to be a function of building mutual trust and respect to harness these conflicts. They're going to have to get a common interest. They're going to have to forego sometimes. <clears throat> Elon's going to have to learn that other people have a right to think differently and he's going to need to try and find a way to learn from it. The amount of stuff that could be learned from the shorts pointing out some of the problems is quite incredible. But if you push against it, if you fight it, it's going to be a big problem. Now, the issue is that mutual trust and respect is not an input. It can't be demanded. It can't be bought. There is a sequence of ingredients that leads to mutual trust and respect. And the analogy I use is like the garden. Imagine mutual trust and respect is a bit like vegetables from a vegetable garden. I can't just walk to the, to the garden and say, give me vegetables. I might get vegetables if I have the right ingredients in the right sequence. So I need to have the seeds planted in the right soil at the right time of the year. I need to be able to have enough water. Again, in sequence, we can't just dump 10,000 litres of water at day one and then have nothing left. We've got to constantly feed it water. We've got to be able to defend against, I don't know, animals and rabbits and, and fruit flies and whatever. And if we do all of those things, the right ingredients in the right sequence, we will create mutual trust and respect. And so if we look at it in reverse, mutual trust and respect, if you can create, will create constructive conflict that will be able to help us better manage the change loop. And so, again, in, in, when looking at Tesla, <clears throat> they have been able to manage that change loop in the past, but these conflicts are coming up. That's what's made me bearish, and that's what's made me take my short position. If you had just taken a short position based on valuation and a few operational screw-ups and a few whatever else, you would have been killed, and a lot of them have been. But now we can analyse that we have a problem. So how do we analyse mutual trust and respect? Well is through a series of ingredients. The first ingredient, sorry, the last ingredient is people. People are absolutely last in the sequence. People are the most important. So there's a conflict here. Most last, but most important because people are a product of their environment, okay? You can have the very best people for a particular task, but if all of those conflicts are playing out, if the conflicts of styles and roles and definitions are playing out, it's going to be destructive, it's going to turn mad. Now, 
I've, I've now reordered some of these ingredients in, into the order that I think Tesla should review them in. When you look at other um, adhesives material, it's in a slightly different order, but depending on where you're on the life cycle, you can change it. What Tesla needs to be doing, or what I would be analyzing is, <clears throat> and sorry, we're with people, we've still got to make sure that people can command and grant mutual trust and respect. Elon in the past has demonstrated an ability to command and grant mutual trust and respect. However, more recently, I don't see that ability to command and grant mutual trust and respect. It's costing him dearly. What should Tesla do first and what am I looking for to if I was to reverse my VAR stance? Well, first is the managerial process. Now, again, for some parts that this can be in a different order, but how are they identifying and aligning as a team? Because at the moment, I cannot see even Elon or the board or people aligning and identifying their real issues. The prioritization needs to be improved. The decision-making process needs to be more collaborative and they need to get better at implementing a whole lot of things. And you've got to get better and better and better and better, faster and faster and faster at doing that. That's where they should be starting, <clears throat> number one. And so even in your own organizations, you might be thinking, or even, or even other companies you've invested in, understanding what is their managerial process. Is the managerial process just based on one person? Again, that's totally normal at a certain phase of the life cycle. Tesla wouldn't have gotten to where it is today if Elon hadn't been a one-man band, sorry, a one-man um, problem-solving and implementation machine, but he's got to start cascading this managerial process. One person cannot handle it. Then, instead of it just being Elon's vision, mission, and values, we need to cascade that as well. But it's hard to do that collaboratively if a team of people can't even come together and just do these basic things. So you first gotta be able to have a team of people that can identify and align around basic issues, basic operational issues, prioritize them, decide what to do and implement. Then we can get a collaborative vision, mission and values that energizes and directs everybody. But missions and visions don't achieve themselves. As Dr. Adesis says, you cannot appoint a pilot to look through the periscope and make a submarine fly. You cannot make a submarine fly by appointing a pilot to look through the periscope. You can't, you can't get somebody like an Elon to constantly be looking through the periscope if the vision and mission and values is about trying to fly somewhere else, trying to do something different. Um, another way to look at it is uh, an organization's like a powerboat. You can have the, the CEO on the front of it yelling his vision and mission, which might be to go left, go left. But if the organization has two engines and the left engine is 500 horsepower and the right engine is five horsepower, this next ingredient, the structure essentially, doesn't matter how loud the CEO yells, that boat's going to the right because the left-hand engine is going to push them there. And so you've actually got to get that structure to suit the mission and vision and the values. But again, for Tesla, where they are at the moment, the reason why I put managerial process first is that if that team, without Elon being in the center of everything, can't get on top of their basic issues, align what the issues are, priorities and decide, it's next to impossible to have a collaborative vision and mission. And it's then even more impossible to go and build the right structure because the right structure has a huge amount of conflict because the right structure has things like roles and responsibilities. Inside roles and responsibilities is things like time orientation. If you give somebody short-term and long-term responsibilities, the short-term always wins. But often we see in roles and responsibilities conflict built in. Authorities become a big issue. At the moment, it seems like Elon maintains all the authority, but in reality, you've got to be able to cascade that down, but you need to have the managerial process in place first. Delegation of authority without the right systems and process, without the right managerial process, is abdication, and abdication leads to bankruptcy. So we don't ad advocate abdication by any means. Getting the right rewards, to achieve a mission. And as part of all of that is information flows as well. 
And so this is where mutual trust and respect can be built. If you have a managerial process to harness all these conflicts and a vision, mission and values that everybody's collaboratively involved in, so you've decentralized that entrepreneurship and a structure to achieve <clears throat> that mission, so then that way you have people in the right structure for a mission they understand and managerial process that integrates and binds them together. That's when you can get mutual trust and respect. That's when you're going to be able to harness these conflicts and that's when you're going to be able to manage this change loop. And so in sort of finalizing, it's understanding that this is not one size fits all. And what Elon has done to date Getting it up through GoGo -Go has been absolutely fine, no problem. But now entering the adolescence phase, I think starting probably from last year when the executive departure started, when some of the operational um, things started, we need to update our managerial process. We need to update our mission, vision and values. We need to update the structure. We need to update the people. So for as long as I don't see these things occurring, and it's highly unlikely they will because people like Elon need a burning platform. They generally have to wait until all shit is broken loose. I'm going to be bearish. I'm going to be short. I'm going to be adding to it. As soon as we see that the things sort of resolve themselves, we might be able to, to uh, get on top of um, where the performance might end up being. So again, from a trading point of view, if we go back to even say monthly bars, Yeah, you know, betting against this company over here has been lunacy. Over here, we are starting now to see some of the dysfunction play out. And at the moment, over here, I'm keeping a real eye out. Oops, wrong way. <clears throat> because now we're starting to see quite a big reversal. We've reached quite a point of uh, point of of, uh, of resistance. Um, I think we had a short here. But through a little bit of uh, disingenuous communication, I think he's kept the dream alive a little lower. And I think we're about to see, uh, see that come down. Again, not financial advice. This is just sharing concepts um, that I find really interesting. And I, uh, I will just turn this off here and just come back to you. Ah, I haven't been sharing screen. Is that right? Uh, anyway, I'm going to uh, close up there. Um, hopefully you found this, uh, this interesting. I'll bring it back to this organizational life cycle model uh, over here. You know, why do organizations grow, age and die? Well, it's, it's all in this life cycle model. These are the things that are, are normal. These are the abnormal things. It's this change loop that is the major issue. Um, what we are measuring is flexibility versus predictability controls and self-control. We're about to enter this adolescence phase because of in reaction to these issues, I very much believe that's going to create a whole lot of downside risk because these different conflicts are going to play out and it doesn't sound like they're going to be aware of them and we're going to end up in a really high risk position. Ultimately, what they need to do is find a way to build mutual trust and respect and they've got to be able to, when you're in the painting, you can't see the whole picture. This is the problem. You actually need to be able to have external assistance and that's what Adesis does. We provide, it's a little bit tongue in cheek sometimes, but we, we call it therapy in that, uh, or it's really about uh, what we call symbogists where we can get the synergy and help you unpack these things long term without uh, without the destructive conflict. So with that being said, I will say good evening to you and hope this has uh, hope this has been of interest. Thank you very much.